Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Middle Earth Readings. I am your host, Maggie Rose Cunningham. It's lovely to see you. My camera appears to be a bit wonky, so I hope that you can see me okay. Uh, today, we are exploring through Middle Earth Readings our wild sides. We're going to be working for through the course of this lunar month, Happy New Moon, for those of you who are here with me live. We're going to be exploring um, our connection with the wild and the archetype of the the edge walker or the shaman you might think of it as being the mystic that aspect of us that part of us that is able to move beyond the the present reality and i'm in present reality in terms of the the physical realities that around you in the moment but also energetically what is happening to you in the moment that connects to the future connects to possibility a little bit different to the seer so the seer is very much in the present moment engaged with the present moment and they may receive stuff sort of externally from them that gives them an insight that gives them insight that gives them oracular insight whereas the shaman the idea with the with the shaman is that there is a part of the self that actually um, leaves the body um, often seen as being connected with like a little silver thread it's like this um separation of part of the conscious self that then journeys out into the other worlds into the other realms out into possibility and then comes back and one of the reasons why we often feel this really strong need to connect with our to reconnect let's say with our world side so i'm just going to move my screen because it's really going um wonky so apologies if i'm making you a bit seasick why is it doing that i don't know maybe it's because we're talking about our world sides and it doesn't want to be a square a boring square um is because we, we feel that the instinctive need to reconnect with something that isn't in the sort of the tamed, the known, what in the Northern tradition we might might refer to as in and guard, the inner realm, the known realm, the safe realm to a certain extent. Because when we journey out, we realize that part of us has always existed in the realm of the wild and in the realm of possibility. And we know in the world today that if we, as a species, we're talking collectively now, if we as a species do not reconnect with that wild side, with that side that is intimately part of nature, you know, we're not going to get very far. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And we're going to be doing that in a slightly, hmm, because we're going to be spending the month looking at the wild side, so we're going to start by actually looking at the tame side. What does it mean to be tame? So I want you to be have you having a think as you're joining me and hello everybody who's joining me and thank you. I can see that you are sharing your rooms. We'll go through them in a moment so you know what we're going to be covering today. Have you got uh, a beloved family pet? I've got a beloved family pet or you remember a family pet, perhaps you've got a few. We have four cats here. Um, have you, are you someone who's been brought up on a farm or you are um, familiar with, let's say, like domesticated um, animals and think about what your expectations are around what it means to be um, tame and feel it into your pet you know what are the things that you love about your pet and um, you know, as I was thinking about this I was thinking you know we have we've always had multiple cats and there have always been some that you might argue are more um, tame in some way no, they're very uh, trusting of human beings. They will go up to any human being. They will you know, make friends with you. They're very um, dependent on you for, for food. So they don't tend to go out and find their own food. They don't go to other people's houses to go and find their own food. They're not going and you know, getting birds or doing whatever it is that they do. So there are variations of, of tameness. And I have to say that, you know, we've, we've always had some cats um, in our little packs, let's say, who are the tame ones and some who are a bit more wild. I've got a little bit of a fondness for the wild ones, if I'm honest, the ones who are sort of, um, yeah, I could do without you. You're all right, you know, you're okay. I can hang out with you and that's fine, but but I'd be okay if I was on my own. Uh, for those of you who have dogs as well, you know, there are, um, there are dogs who are very um, dependent on us. They wouldn't survive without us. So there are, there are also dogs who we, we have an interdependency with, uh, working dogs, uh, my sister's, um, one of her partners was a, a shepherd, and we had she had a dog living with her. Lass who was a working dog, and there was a there was an interdependency. 
And these are some of the things that I want to bring out when we think about um, tameness. And think about it in terms of um, animals that you know, because then we can start to think, well, what are our expectations of ourselves in the realm of being tame? And what are our, our, our expectations of um, others, of other human beings in the realm of our, of our world? Where is the room for wildness? So we've talked about um, dependency. And some of you, if you think about it in the human context, might think about that in terms of people talk about codependent relationships, like unhealthy relationships where a person is not in the point where I, it's not that I want to be in this relationship or with this company or you know with this group of friends, but they don't believe that they could survive without them. And so there is a, um, a sacrifice of everything that you think is not that they're not going to like you become so dependent that everything your survival is based on those those other people as opposed to um interdependence which is when it's like a structure you know and you're leaning into each other and there are there are needs that are being met both sides and so it's not power on one side and powerlessness on the other and what i've described with the with the cat let's say is let's say uh, tolerance you no know? i will tolerate you and um, you know there are different levels of tolerance there and when we get to the point where we're sort of hanging around in a in a job or in a family or in a friendship where, where we literally either feel like we're just tolerated or we're just tolerating maybe that's a time for us to go and find our wild side again and say okay what's possible what's possible what would happen if I reconnected with my um, my mystic and I traveled out and I said you know what's possible in the world and I'm so sorry you know what I think's happened while I was away on retreat all of my computer stuff was um moved by members of my family who i too clearly tolerate <laughs> who i have interdependent with and they've not put it up right again so i apologize i'm going to have to keep on adjusting the screen because i think that they might have unscrewed the um the stand for my screen so sorry everybody so this is fun beautiful example there of interdependence where i depend on them to put my computer things back in the right place if they're going to use them while I'm away. So we are thinking about this and so when we think about the wild side I do feel is that when we are saying you know I want to reconnect with the wild I want to go out and um, in Sooner Starwheel this month they did a piece for those of you who are members of Sooner Starwheel I can't believe it it's still lilting horribly let me see if I've got a weight or something that can hold it in place for you I do apologize this is not what I had planned. I had not planned to be continually adjusting my computer screen so that you could actually see me during the course of this session. Um, there we go. Before we're able to say, you know, I want to go out, I know that I want to reconnect with my, uh, with my wild side. What is it that you are wanting to disconnect from? What's become tamed that is too tame, too um, subjugated. Um, when you think about the word tame, if you were to look up the word tame, you can see there are different meanings. There are some meanings which mean um, like subjugation, to be subjugated or to be subdued. And there are others which are more around being homely or domesticated or, you know, of the hearth. And I think that's quite a useful distinction is to say, when have I got to the point where I am um, subjugated? And when am I in the point where I'm saying, actually, we are in a state where we are creating an independent, we are weaving a, a home, a hearth, a collaboration together, which does rely on um, cooperation and it does rely on us being, to a certain extent, predictable with each other and having agreed, you know, this is where the water will be, you know, for the cats, you know, those sorts of things. Um, I think that this this sense maybe of saying you know I'm going out into the world I'm going out to claim my world side and then I'm coming back sometimes we want to be able to nurture our world sides within our daily lives so let's look at where the tame bits are and where there's a little bit of wriggle room for you so that's going to be our little bit of a theme for this coming um, month is looking at the world side looking at the mystic looking at the the shaman who journeys out to find that wild wisdom to recover that power but there's no point in either you going out on a shamanic journey or on you um, working with a shamanic practitioner who is going to bring back some of your power or some of your essence if you're not able to receive it because you're in a place where you're so tame or so subjugated that you can't 
hold that power and stand with it and claim it and honour it as your own. So we're looking at that through the course of this week and helping us then to work more on the on the wild side. Darcy says, for the Loki in your life. <laughs> Indeed. So yes, I mean, you could argue that um, Loki is a very, very important aspect of um, Odin's um, internal mechanism for staying connected with his wild side at all times. You know, I think that Odin has multiple ways in which he goes out and reconnects with that wild side. You know, he has his eye under the well and he goes off, you know, when he goes to find the runes and he's known as the wanderer, he goes out into the world, he's reconnecting all the time, finding that knowledge from beyond his immediate sphere of control. But Loki is that reminder, it's the wild side reminder that's always there with him, you know, and they're blood brothers for a reason. So yes, absolutely. So we are um, on this new moon, we are entering what is um, could be referred to as um, after Litha, which means after Litha, after the solstice, or could be um, Riodmonath in the Anglo-Saxon, which means weed month. And there are, in again, in Suna Starwell, I did a little piece on um, Utaseta, which is uh, the um, practice of sitting out, of going and reclaiming your wild side in the Northern tradition. I also talked about the blue moon and why when we have periods of time like um, this, when we have um, a second full moon coming up um so we've got one full moon in august and then a second full moon in august and the 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 full moon was like really really close to um litha you know we, it's not always clear whether our ancestors would have said that this was you know what the name of the month was we can't be absolutely certain so i gave an explanation of why i am referring to this month as we order um and not after a litha uh, so, yeah, we're not going to go into that in a huge amount of detail here, but what I wanted to reflect on here was that um, when we think about weed month, it's quite a fun uh, term because weed meant plant in the, back in the day. So it was plant month, which makes sense. The plants are going wild everywhere. But to us now, obviously, a weed is a plant that's in the wrong place. And there is this sense of taming. So you might think about taming animals, you might also think about taming your garden and how important it is now. You know, we're being encouraged all of the time to have a part of our gardens that is wild, that isn't um, tamed, that isn't we have decided that this plant is in the wrong place. Now you could argue that some of the plants that we have in our, you know, are not indigenous anymore and so they're really quite literally in the wrong place or that there are plants that overwhelm the rest of the environment when we want to be creating an, an ecosystem. It's not as simple as just saying, we'll just leave it and we'll have a jungle of bindweed and ground elder, hooray. No, we do need to do some work on it, but that balance between the tamed and the wild is actually really useful for us to look in the context of gardening. And Weed One Earth is a great time to do that, to think about that in terms of plant month. So it's another little bit for you to play with there. So, as I have said, we have the new moon, so new moon today, and it's the new moon in Urus, um, which is one of the reasons why wildness came up so strongly for me. So here we have our Urus rune. Is there anyone in the chat who said they had Urus? Justine, you said you've got Urus. Let's see who else has got Urus. Anybody else? Mm -mm -mm. Looks like it's you, Justine. So fill into if there's anything particular for you around um, Urus. And obviously anyone else, if you are working with Urus as your spirit guide rune at the moment, then this is... Um, for you but broadly speaking the energy that is available to us as we build towards the um the full moon coming in two weeks time is this new moon in uru's energy so this reconnection with the wild very very important for uru so uru's is the rune of the aurochs you can sort of see this big sort of bovine shape here with the um the back of the or of the aurochs coming down there sometimes we see it this way and see the horns of the aurochs as well and so anything that you can do to reconnect with the world, whether you're actually planning to go, and obviously for some of us, summer holidays are coming, you know, is that a retreat for you or is it a reconnection with the wild? And, you know, we, we might ask that as a question later in the month. Um, is a, a time when we can start to think about, you know, I like to try and take my shoes off and walk barefoot in the garden at least once a day, just to sort of reconnect with that, um, with, with nature and to, and to balance. What are those little things that you can do? You know, it's raining, go and walk out in the rain or, you know, whatever the weather is, sort of be present to it. All of these things are um, suggested through the, the Uru's rune. So it's a healing rune. It's also a rune of tenacity. It's a rune of recovering our deep energy. 
So when we have this new moon energy, we can talk about, you know, I want to, how can I honor my, my animal nature? How can I really honor my animal nature, be part of nature, be present to nature? How can I listen to my body more fully through the course of this month? You know, the wisdom of nature that is present in me. So recognizing that actually, I don't always have to go out into nature. Everything that is around us is technically part of nature. Now, what does that mean when we think about it that way? What is the ecosystem of home that we've created with our, our nature-based bodies moving through them? Maybe we've got plants or we've got weaving. You know, the very, very interesting relationship when you start to think about your home as part of the natural world and the, the natural world is then an extension of it. All of these things are, you know, Uru says, you know, try that, play with that, connect with the body, honor your animal self through the course of this month. And this is really very much about connecting with the healer within, you know, which if you think about the shaman or the mystic, one of their jobs is to help us to reconnect with those parts of ourselves that maybe have been tamed out of us or repressed in some way. So for some of you, you will feel like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a natural healer, but I'm, you know, I'm a really deplete place myself right now. How can this time of reaching out and reconnecting um, reignite that part. So if you have urus, it may well be that it's saying there's a healer within you who needs some a little bit of nurturing. Okay, so that's today. And then the rest of our planetary movements happen over the um, 23rd and 24th this week. So our next movement isn't a planet moving, it's one of the halls. So the halls um, correlate to the zodiac. So we are going to be moving into um, Baldur's Hall, um, zodiac Leo. Uh, Balder is the god of the sun, he's the god of light, he is the god of, it's said that nothing impure can enter his hall. Now I find that wording a little bit problematic and it's one of the ones that I do actually want to go and look at the old text to see what the word was, it's one of those things on my to-do list, because this idea of impurity is, is interesting. Um, a little bit Christian to me if I'm honest and obviously most of the texts that we have that are written about from the northern tradition spiritual and um, from the ancient spiritual traditions of the north were written by um, Christians were written by Christian monks so I'm not sure about that but there is an interesting idea around what is allowed and what is not in Baldur's Hall that comes through here um, what do I allow into my home what do I not do I want to invite more of the wild into my home or do I not? No, it's this, it's this idea that there are subtle boundaries that are always at play and that Baldur's mere presence, the presence of the light, um, excludes some other things. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? We don't know. We're not necessarily sure. However, what is interesting, of course, is that Baldur is a young youthful god whose death is predicted very very early on and that he the god of the light is going to go down into Helheim down into heaven for a long period of time until after the the great battle of the gods and then he will rise again and it could be this huge like mythic story of the sun and you know that the sun leaves its residence its place where only the light can exist and goes down into the place of the dark and I wonder sometimes whether Balder is a representation of that, the newborn soul, you know, and here I am in Inengard in my place, my safe place, which is great and I love it and it's wonderful and everyone thinks I'm brilliant here and isn't that fabulous? And yet I need to take the journey into maturity, into experience, into claiming my wild self, my other, the other aspects of my power before I can ascend and become the, the ruler of the gods. You know, Baldur is um, Odin's son, we don't know necessarily, but it seems likely that he's the one who will be the, you know, the lead in the next pantheon, but he has to take that descent into darkness. He has to travel into his own wild side, you know, to be separated from the light, perhaps from his own light before he can even recognize it and know it. So with Baldur's journey, if we're working with him and you feel like really cool to work with him, it's a great time to work with him through the course of, of this um, of his month coming up from the 23rd of um, July all the way through to the end of August. You might want to think about this in terms of um, when, 
nasty, horrible, mean stuff happens to you, you know, and you think, why? Obviously, there is a point where you just go, wow, you know, no, no, this isn't my life. Why has this happened? No, absolutely not. And then there is a point where you say, okay, am I going to allow myself to be tamed by the doom of what's just happened? You know, by the, am I going to allow myself to be crushed by it, to become a victim of it? Or am I going to dig deep and start to work in a more interdependent way with that doom and say, okay, that might not be what I'm chosen, but it's what I've got. You know, where is my power in this? What am I going to do in order to reclaim that power? Is what comes through with Balder. So there's a couple of ways in which you can work with Balder around um, him being a role model for stepping into the darkness, but also in terms of saying this is a journey from things happening to me to me then happening to them. You know? So have a little bit of a play with that. Now, I wanted to bring in at this point our second... Uh, power rune, our second spirit guide rune, rune which is Dargas. So this is one that I pulled. Um, my my seer self had a little pull of the of the runes, and this came up as useful for Baldur's Hall. We could also have had Suello, but Suello is coming later in the month. Suello is the rune of the sun. Dargas is the rune of the day. So it's the daylight. It's enlightenment. It's transformation. It's like visioning. It's that sudden knowledge. And what I find interesting, I think about it, and I think, well, when we're in the um, the sunlight and the sun is so bright. We can't always tell which um, way to go. We can't see the rest of the stars. We can see the sun, obviously that helps us, but we can't see the stars. So we're just like, right, I'm going in this direction, I'm going in this direction. When the sun goes down, we can see the stars and we have more of a sense of like the universe, of our place in the universe. We have a bigger, um, we get the bigger picture. We go, oh, you know, we're a tiny planet. For a tiny tiny planet there is a lot more out there which we don't get in the in the daylight and Darga is actually if you can see has got two parts of it so this, although it says day and there is a deity called Darg who is day and he is the son of the goddess um, Not who is night I always think that these two bits represent the union of the day and night this sort of uh, interplay between them and Dargas represents that point where we are able to receive the wisdom of the day and the wisdom of the night and they come together and we go oh that's what it meant. It activates the seer self. Um, I always think about Balder maybe sitting at the, his, at the table, at Hella's table, and he's comfortable, don't get me wrong, he's an honoured guest there, looking up at his hall and suddenly going, and that's what that meant. And when I return, I have so much more experience and wisdom because I've got to view like my life and what I stood for and all of these things from this place. You know, with a whole new perspective, like multiple perspectives all come in and go, Vroom with the Dargaz rune. And so what this reminds us of when within the context of thinking about wildness and tameness is, is it a case of like, I need to just claim my wild self and I'm out there and I'm brilliant and I'm wild, or is it actually my wild self and my tame self or half self, you might say as well, I'm not sure if tame is my favorite word for it, um, work together, you know, they work together. I am moving in and out of the space of being like predictable, collaborative, communal, agreed and, unpredictable, new power coming through and all of these things. And, and it, it says, yes, it's possible. It is possible to have that balance with the Dargaz rune. Um, Suki, you've got Dargaz, so you have a little play with that. Is there anything else that um, Dargaz wants to come? A lovely bit of rain there. I think for, for you, Suki, so you're saying, I've got a lovely bit of rain, I've got my rune of the day is Dargaz. Um, it is that sense of like the, the joy in the small things and that sometimes we're like, oh, you know, I've got to do all of this stuff. And then you go, I'd really like to just, um, go and watch the rain and listen to the rain. And sometimes it is in those moments of pause that we get that, that, that deep knowing, that sense of, oh, suddenly it all makes sense because we allow ourselves to slow down. Now we allow our soul to catch up with us, you know, and then we're all, we're present. All of us is present and suddenly it becomes clear in that moment. Um, I should have said, Justine, Think that we had what we needed from the Uru's room. If anything else comes through, let me, I will let you know. But uh, yes, I think that wildness of the Uru's room spoke powerfully to us, didn't it? So anybody else with Dargas? I don't think so from those of you who are here. Hi, Carolyn, lovely to see you. We've got a couple of people with Hargalas. We are doing Hargalas today. And yeah. 
Carolyn, you're saying, oh, I love to work with um, Urus through, uh, you started working with um, with Awaken. So yes, we're in the half month of Urus. That started yesterday. So we've already got this very strong Urus energy. Thank you, Carolyn. It's a great reminder that the sun is actually in Urus at the moment. Um, so yes, for those of you who want to work with your Urus rune, it's a perfect time to be working with Urus with a new moon in Urus as well. Fabulous. Okay, so... Our next planetary movement is uh, Tia's chariot. So this is the Roman equivalent of Mars. Tia, god of victory, the warrior, the sort of great truth teller, you know, standing very much in integrity. And he is moving into Rado. Now we're not going to cover Rado because that is coming um, later in the month. What we're going to be covering is um, Tewers, which is Tia's rune. So for Tia in Rado, there is a real reminder again in terms of thinking about the journeying and this sense of journeying and going out into the wilds and the journey that we were talking about with Boulder as well. Our Tears chariot comes and reinforces this. So he moves on the 23rd and he is going to be saying, talking very much about how um, the road shapes us, but we also shape the road. He says, um, a heart that is broken is also a heart that will heal and will heal and be stronger and contain the wisdom of that breaking within it. Um, I know Suzanne, you know the proper word, I've forgotten what the proper word is, you know, the, the um, I would say the Japanese um, art form of taking something broken and then mending it and it is more beautiful once it's mended. It's that, um, that um, piece is what Tia is talking to us about. He's saying, uh, and he says, um, see that hero on the horizon the one that seems like so far away from where you are right now. That hero is you. Now, that is what he says. He says, the journey that you are currently taking is the journey towards the hero you're going to become. Very much speaking about all of these things, these, these moments that come, whether it's pleasurable or painful, whether it's you know, surface level or deep, all of them um, shape us, but we shape them and we shape the meaning that we make from them and we um, create the future from them. They create our momentum as we move forward and they shape the hero that we are becoming. And that sense of um, we might not know exactly where the journey takes us, but we know how we want to show up to it is just as powerful and just as strong as whatever the events are in shaping that future unfolding of you, that future blooming of you. That's when we talk about the interdependence between you and your destiny. You know? Destiny is saying one thing, you're saying another, and together you're going to create something fabulous, is what um, Tear is talking about. So that's Tear's Chariot in Rado. We're going to be covering Rado later, but it's the journey. Very much talking about the journey and the hero, the warrior, the priest, the king, the sovereign, whatever you want to call it, who is on that journey and the way that they're shaped by the journey and they shape the journey and they shape themselves on the course. But Tia also, um, the rune that I pulled for uh, today that seemed most appropriate for us to explore at this point um, in Middle Earth readings is the Tewa's rune, which is Tia's rune. And it is very much that reminder that um, things may not go the way that we want them to, but we still get to choose how we show up in the moment. And I talk, when I talk to people and we work one-to-one -one on this, I say there is a difference between our, our vision or the collective vision, let's say. Now, in the context of a, a company, an organisation, let's say, you know, everything's going the way that they want it to go, la 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 la, it's all fine, we've got our vision, we're all, all, all good, and then circumstances change. You know? And it's like, oh, suddenly we don't know where we're going and uncertainty comes through and it's like, oh no, maybe you know, you're on the road and the storm is looming. You know? At that point, it is your values that dictate the next action you're going to take because you've lost the vision for the moment. So in the context of you know, the storm on the horizon, if your values are um, safety, comfort, um, security, then you're going to be looking for the nearest inn to go and stay in. You know? If your values are you know, adventure, getting there on time when I said I was going to get there. Um, braving, you know, finding my edges, courage, you know, then you're going to go into the storm. Now, what's important is that 
Um, neither of those things is wrong. No. And let's say you are a, a, a young pregnant woman with babes in arms on her journey and see, she sees the storm in the distance, you know, what's the, what are the values now? Safety, security, comfort, you know, not just for her, for her children. And so she goes to the inn. You see somebody else, you no know, warrioress, who is destined to go and, you know, she said, I'm going to go and help to fight in this battle that's coming to defend from an army that is seeking our, our people. The storm is coming. Maybe she's not going to go to the inn. Maybe she's going to go through the storm. So it's about the values, the, the values in the moment, you know, <clears throat> the, 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 that keep you going on course. So this is what... Um, Tia and t is offering us with Tewa. So if you're working with your spirit guide room, you want to be feeling into those those values, those things. That, okay, I might not know exactly where I'm going, but what is it that my values tell me is important at this point? Okay, so our final movement, and again, this isn't a movement per se, but this is Frigg's Chariot. So Frigg's Chariot will be going into retrograde. So Frigg's Chariot is um, Venus in the Roman Church. She's moving into retrograde on the she's moving on the 24th but she's got her transition day so she's going to start to look as if she's still about the 22nd and then she's got to stay there until september the 3rd now frick's chariot moves into um retrograde much less frequently than odin's chariot so i want you to imagine their dance for the moment so we've got sooner's chariot the sun which is there to guide us to help us to go in the correct direction to resonate with that of the energy that is um like the pure energy of each of the runes so that when we have our half months we're in the half month of urus at the moment the energy of urus is available to us and strong and then you have odin's chariot and frigg's chariot which are the planets that you know from our perspective you know well they are <laughs> not from our perspective they're the closest to the sun and from our perspective, sometimes they are ahead of the sun, sometimes they're behind, they're, you know, and they move quite fast. And what has been happening for the last uh, year is that Frigg's chariot has been in front. It's been steadily moving in front, in front, in front, in front. And Odin's chariot's been doing this, right behind, right behind, right behind, right behind, right behind, right behind. Now, Frigg's chariot's going into retrograde. And Odin's chariot is in direct motion at the moment. So he's going to go shooting forward, leading from the sun. And Frigg's chariot is going to start to um, recede a little bit. She's going to get a little bit slower. And during this time, uh, the rune that I pulled to help us to understand this and to, to really feel into her retrograde motion or her retreat motion, as I prefer to call it, is um, Issa. That's my Issa rune. Here we go. So the Issa rune. So Issa is your spirit guide when listening up at this point. Um, so when the planets go into retreat, their um, guiding influence is less available to us. There is a period of time where they say, you're on your own a little bit here. And Frigg is the um, leader of the space of the hearth. She is the leader of um, collaboration. So when we're thinking about this in the context of the um, the shaman or the mystic, who is by definition a lone figure, you know, who goes out into the wilds and then comes back and brings their wisdom or their knowledge or the power or whatever it is that they have brought, they bring it back into their communities. The fact that she is um, absent or is going to be absent means that we have to work on our relationships much more consciously so to a certain extent she's saying here we are with the isa rune the rune of stability the rune of ice the rune of stillness and silence and there is a solitude that comes to it that's going to be quite um, alluring to many of us you know i know that i'm a natural mystic and so that uh, the introvert in me is going to come out strong during this period of time but what she's also saying and what we're being reminded of is that there is danger in the Easter room. There's danger of, you know, we, we, don't, we don't speak, we don't make change, we get stuck. Um, you know, we're out in the wilds for too long. We don't bring back what we've learned. We don't bring that power back. And so nothing happens, you know, nothing happens and nothing changes. And so she says, you know, I am going to not be present. I will be in retreat, not just so that you have your time to be on your own 
but so that you get to look at some of these spaces that are tame or that are um, codependent or dependent that have become um, stagnant or disempowering and to give that a little bit of a shake and have a little bit of remodeling of those spaces because she is you know she's like right these are the roles this is how we're all collaborating so when she's away we get to unpick those a little bit you know to change those a little bit so yes it's a time for being um, alone but she says don't stay out there you've got to come back You've got to bring your knowledge back. You've got to bring it back and share it out in the world. And it might be uncomfortable and there might be arguments and there might be challenges because Frigga is not there because she's in retreat. Which is, this is a time for remodeling that. Which is why I found it very useful that our uh, next power room that came up was Hargalaz. So Hargalaz is the rune of the hail seed. So it's also a rune of ice, but whereas um, Issa brings that, that stillness and that... Um, Stability that occasionally can get us stuck. Hargalaz does not get us stuck. Hargalaz unsticks us. So if you're feeling like, oh, I've been in the Issa energy for too long, or I'm struggling, or there are cracks appearing in these relationships, that might be a time to draw on a little bit of Hargalaz energy, perhaps do a bit of Hargalaz chanting, um, bring in that energy of the storm, like literally bring it in. You know, sometimes the storm can change destiny. Think about, you know, Elizabeth the first with the armada and the Spanish, they were destined, you know, they were destined to come and, you know, win. And then the storm came and it changed everything. So you can draw in that Hargalaz energy. So I need that to change energy. I don't know what's coming because I'll, but I'm embracing the world. I'm okay with this. I'm going to call that Hargalaz energy in for that, uh, that change, that sort of shaking up of it a little bit. And, and I'm going to be prepared that there might be some fallout from that, which again, you might argue, well, if you're going to have a little bit, a few arguments, some fallout, some difficulties, some challenges, you might as well do it when Frigg's in retrograde because it's going to happen anyway. Just saying. Okay. And then our final rune, if you're thinking, whoa, what's Maggie doing here? She's, what, what's she doing here? I don't want storms and arguments. After the... I refuse to be stuck in Issa and I've called on Hargalaz and okay, the Hargalaz energy is there a little bit and the wildness is coming through and I'm being a bit of a disruptor and this stuff is happening. We have a lovely reminder, the last room that I drew for this session was Yera. So Yera is the balance of summer and winter, of ice and fire, of um, stillness and change. And it is that reminder that as long as we are in momentum, as long as we are moving forward, as long as we are taking the journey, we are walking within the wheel of the year, things will change. And they will change for the better. Yera is the rune of success and harvest. And it is a reminder that when we are in uh, Weald Monath, in Weed Month, um, we might feel as if you know we're, we're, we're right in the middle of the harvest, but the seed of the winter has already been planted and is already coming. And the seeds of the new year of the um, have already fallen in many cases from the plants and are being sown back into the earth. And that's a very useful reminder for, for Yara of this um, balance between the wild and the tame. If we think about um, harvesting, we can become so efficient at harvesting that we forget to honour the earth by offering some of our um, bounty back to it without expectation of it producing more as well as planting some into the earth with expectation of it removing more it's that honoring of the wild side that we do when we sacrifice when we make sacred when we say no i am offering this purely from gratitude and purely as an acknowledgement that the world will never be fully tame without the wild side but that also we cannot survive with you know human beings we're not designed to be you know out there with, without cooperation if we think about reclaiming that word tame perhaps a little bit and saying like something slightly different any wor words on a postcard what would you like to choose instead of so if you've got our sexy wild side that everyone's happy with reclaiming the wild at the moment aren't they what would you have on that side i might say hearth i'm going to play with hearth side my hearth side you know, Equal, just as just as important, but it's that balance between the two that's important and that Yera is offering to us and saying that when we reclaim the wild, we get back into balance with the hearth side. The two of them work together much more um, powerfully 
let's have a little look at those of you whose runes we have not covered. So Sugal, we have done Dargas, Megan, we've done Hargalas, um, Esther, you've got Manas, which is also your Nornis, um, if for this new Nornis cycle. Oh, I, th mm. I think you probably already know with the, the, the Manas doing that real sort of standing in your, in your power piece. I'm not sure if it, has, it just I just want to sort of reiterate that for you Esther I think really with the, your your manners room there something there about um recognizing that even when parts of you are traveling out into the world and being the warrior self or the mystic self that mana self that is receiving information and taking decisions is always there always present and always powerful Suzanne you've got Ansu's the singer moving through the, the the rushing wind the new ideas coming through hmm i think it's really just it's just saying yeah share your gifts share your communication um with the ansu's rune remembering that it's got the shape where it's got the the stave and then the two bits coming down that um one could be seen as the sort of solitary path of you know going out finding the information bringing that in receiving it all the new ideas all the um like the, the the path of the seer all of these things you know sort of coming in and then the other is expressing it out again and it's becoming that channel of receiving in and out with the ansu's rune that's what's coming forward trish you have got ingus lovely seed of the earth so ingus is a very important rune for this month so i've not covered it if you're in sooner star Wars, you will already know this we will be covering it later in the month when ud's chariot uranus is going to be moving into ingus so just hold on to that, Trish, that that sense of sowing seeds. And actually, I did cover a little bit at the end, didn't I, in terms of thinking about um, harvest and, you know, the seeds that need to be sacrificed, the seeds that need to be sown back in, as well as the ones we're going to eat. Um, might be something useful for you to have a little bit of a play with there. But watch out for Ingus coming later. Carolyn, you've got algas, so it's that sense of um, calling in support and remembering perhaps that when we walk on the wild side when we take a walk on the wild side we're connecting with different forms of support that are the, the stars you know i was talking about the sun and the stars it's like when we are in our busy mode there is support available to us you know there are other people there are hearth spirits there's um you know whatever we invest in that we draw support in but when we go out into the wild the wilderness we're drawing on different forms of support so it might be about playing with that as well and saying you know where do i find those different parts of my support network Justine, we've done Uru, so that's um, great. Darcy, you've got Iwaz, so Iwaz is coming later, but again, a very important rune for, not so much for the um, planetary movements this month, but for the idea of the, the journeyer or the mystic or the wayfarer, and the idea that the staff can be seen almost as a representation of those things that you want to carry with you, the support that you want to walk beside you, um, the it can rep the staff can represent so many different things it's like what does the um staff represent to the the shaman or or the wizard what are what is it a representation of if you think about like like gandalf in the lord of the rings and you see he's oh, God, he's wielding the power and we often get these you know um, in films a big light comes out at the end doesn't it and then lightning flashes out of it but a lot of the time it's it's a walking stick no, it's oh it's there to support me to physically walk forward and to take some of the weight or it's got things carved in it which are reminders or stories that we've kept or it's a particular type of wood that comes from a particular place and we are drawing in the energy of that place because that is where we come from that is a center for our power lots of ways in which the staff becomes part of the journeying kit that helps us to carry our power with us so perhaps have a little bit of a play with that not giving away too many secrets when we do um i was uh chen you had hargalaz as well hail to the storm hail to the storm that was a pun that was an unintended pun obviously hargalaz being the rune of the hail seed um meg you're saying sitting in yes very much so i covered this in um as soon as star with the idea that before we start to sit out to go into the wild places we might need to spend a bit of time sitting in, looking at our tame places. Uh, Carolyn, I'm really glad that that resonated with you. Sorry, my chat is flicking up and down a little bit in a very strange way. I just don't want to make sure that I don't miss anybody. Darcy says, if I open my Peruvian med medicine bundle, we say that any heavy energy around will be transformed to the energy and frequency of the bundle 
and we ask for the higher frequency bundles that are open when ours are, that they rise into the higher frequency. Perhaps Baldur's Hall transforms heavier energies as they enter. I love that idea. It's a really interesting idea. And I do wonder if maybe part of his, uh, you know, that journey into the dark is that ability to then look back and find the wisdom of things that you thought that you took for granted. And then when you don't have them anymore, you go, oh, actually, that was really quite special and important power that other people didn't have. And perhaps that's the teaching that I need to offer to the world. You know, <laughs> something along those lines. You know, that's the, the sort of wisdom that might come through. But I love that, you know, that it might transform heavier energies as they as they come through. Suzanne says the art of contem contemplation, Kintsugi. Thank you. Yes, that was the um, that was the piece that I was looking for. Justine, the road shapes us, but we also shape the road. I'm glad that you enjoyed that morning, Pamela. You have got Issa, so we have covered Issa for you. I think the only thing for you, Pamela, that is there's a like all in its own good time is what comes through with with Issa. And there's almost a sense of um, when I feel into it and I'm breathing, I can feel the the ice, it's sort of beautiful ice around, but there is a light uh, and a warmth shimmering through from the center. It's almost, again, you know, we were talking about the seed. It's almost the sense of the, the hail seed or the, the fire that is born inside the ice, which doesn't come from Northern tradition. If anyone knows about of a um, tradition where the fire is born inside the ice, let me know, but that's just what I'm feeling. It's maybe it's that, maybe it's the light because it's the ice reflect, refracts light, doesn't it? And can make it even more beautiful. It's that sense of like waiting and being fully present that comes through with the Issa rune. Um, Suzanne says, so good time to work with Hourglass to shake it up. Absolutely, it is a good time. Remodeling, yes, to get unstuck. Glad that resonated with you. Sometimes the storm can change destiny. Yes, it can, Justine. And Carolyn says, Yera is a great teacher for me. I underestimated this rune at the beginning and learned to value it. It's a really powerful rune and people can think, oh, it's very, it's gentle and it means harvest and success. It's a deeply, deeply powerful rune. Rune, I should say. Um, Huga side, yeah. I like it, the Huga side and the wild side. Thank you, Justine. I like that. No, mmm, Huga side. Um, Lisa, you have got Feus, we've got the Path of the Serpent there. Well, the only thing that's coming through with me, actually, is we're talking about Yera. So for you, with the Feu energy, there's something about timeliness there. Because the, um, I'm seeing the Path of the Serpent, and obviously for the Serpent, if it's in the cold, it just doesn't have any energy. It's just not going to do anything. So it's that waiting for the sun. I can feel bolder there as well. Um, it's that sense of knowing that what is it that what is the, how does the external environment ignite your inner energy is what's coming through and when does the external environment invite you into rest so this will be the same with, with Balder this idea that he's in the place of the sun and his light is in the sun and then he is traveling down there you go Pamela that's what we were waiting for there's me saying in the middle of the tradition there's no fire that it's reborn in the ice but obviously Balder is the god of light and he goes down into Helheim, which is situated in the realms of ice. That's not ice itself, it's in Niflheim. He's down there doing his thing, burning his light, waiting to be reborn. So, hmm, have a little bit of a play with that. So for you, Lisa, it's very much about responsiveness in the moment um, is coming through. What does your environment um, support you and how does it ignite your energy? Um, Maggie says, this hard should be interesting. Yes, indeed. I'm glad that the thoughts fit well for you, Carolyn. That is wonderful. And Justine says, like sunlight through an icicle. Yes, absolutely. So there we have it, the opening of our walk on the wild side through the course of this month, whether you are celebrating it as um, after Litho, whether you're celebrating it as Wield Monarch, whether you're celebrating it in a totally different way. Um, this lovely um, lunar month of walking with our wild sides and of really feeling into that balance between the wild side and as Justine has now dubbed it, the Huga side. So I look forward to seeing you all very, very soon. And yes, is there anything else I wanted to say? I think only just say thank you so much to those of you again who have been in touch um, when I was unwell. It's much appreciated, I'm feeling much better. Um, yeah, all of us have those moments, don't we, when our energy is just, nope can't do it so I've been honoring that so thank you so much Mwah. love to you all and see you all very soon